In television, everything is gone with the speed of light, literally. And yet, I'm known for a segment that ran at the end of the CBS Evening News, On the Road with Charles Kuralt. I was 22 when I was first hired by CBS News, the youngest reporter they ever hired. But I wasn't cut out to be a real reporter. A real reporter has to stick his nose in where he's not wanted, ask embarrassing questions, dodge bullets, worry about deadlines. So, in 1966, I went into the office of Fred Friendly, the president of CBS News, and I said, why don't you let me wander around the country and do some feature stories? Fred was a hard newsman. He hated feature stories. <laughs> so he said, if you want to do feature stories, why don't you go do them in Vietnam? Well, I had just returned from Vietnam, and I knew I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so he sent me on an expedition to cover a trip to the North Pole. When I returned, I went to Richard Salent, who had replaced Fred Friendly, and I said, why don't you let me wander around the country and do some feature stories? <laughs> All right, he said, just keep your budget low. I got out of his office before he had time to change his mind. And so, I want moseyed about the country, pausing in every part of every state, all at CBS's expense. I did stories about small towns, uh, chance encounters, and ordinary people. For 25 or 30 years, I never had an assignment. I relied on letters from readers and uh, chance encounters for story ideas. In this time, my crew and I ran through six motorhomes. And who were these people that I found so fascinating? Well, there was Bill Bodish, who built a 56-foot yacht in his back field, sold his farm, hauled the yacht to the Mississippi to set off on a world cruise. Or uh, Jethro Mann, who bought up old bicycles and repaired them so the poor kids in his neighborhood would have a bike to ride. Or uh, Bob Specka, who would set up his 350,000 dominoes to topple over in spectacular patterns. These were people who measured the value of their lives by the joy their work gave them. As for the work I did, I, I could never remember a time when I didn't want to be a reporter. I don't know where I got the notion it was a romantic calling. Uh, an early teenager, I was working at a radio station in Charlotte. I was a little bit of what you would call a nerd. I, I didn't have any girlfriends, and I really wasn't a very social boy, but I just loved working and writing at the radio station. When I was 16, I came here, the University of North Carolina. Four years later, I was elected the editor of the Daily Tar Heel, a job that so preoccupied me that I didn't quite get to graduate with the other members of my class. And I returned here very often. I gave talks, and I was the creator of some words that you might recognize that were used to advertise the university. What is it that binds us to this place as to no other? It is not the well, or the bell, or the stone walls, or the crisp October nights, or the memory of dogwoods blooming. Our love for this place is based on the fact that it is, as it was meant to be, the university of the people. And so, when I became ill, not long into my retirement, I wrote to UNC President Bill Friday. Dear Bill, I don't think I am dying. In fact, I seem to be recovering nicely, but this experience has given me intimations of mortality. I thought I would ask if you have any way of finding out if there are a couple of burial plots in Chapel Hill. Of course, the campus would be ideal, but I know that's probably out of the question. I should have thought of this 40 years ago. Love to Ida, and I hope to see you before the roses finish blooming.
Two days after writing that, I lay dead in a New York hospital from complications from lupus. The letter hadn't reached Bill Friday. But when it did, he found a man named George Horton, who had several plots, owned several plots in the cemetery, but he wouldn't sell any of them. He would, however, give me two of them. And so here we are. And what remains, I suppose, uh, beyond the broadcasts and the headstones are the memories of those who knew me. Charles Kuralt preserved for us every reason we have to be hopeful about this country. Those were the words of Charles Osgood. My wife, Petey Beard Kuralt, who has lain here beside me for the past 16 years, said I was the best man she ever met which may not be the same thing as the best husband. I was away so often, I barely spent more than a week at a time with her during our married life. I exasperated those closest to me with all the family events I missed, the weddings, the holidays, the birthdays. Pat Shannon, a woman that I met on the road, always said she was puzzled when I was described as balding and pudgy. For her, I was the most attractive man she ever met. Andy Rooney, the CBS commentator, said he was sure I wouldn't be content just staying here. We'll see. <laughs>